football is a violent sport, which is what makes evaluating players still in high school so difficult. With how prevalent injuries are at all levels, it's tough to predict who will actually make it to the NFL. That's what makes things like the USA Today All-USA High School football team so intriguing. These young men were among the best of the best, but many of them never found NFL greatness though this class has a higher hit rate than most. Today, we're taking a look back at the 1988 USA Today All-USA team and seeing what happened to all 24 players, starting with the offense. Terry Kirby, running back. Kirby played his high school ball at Tab, where he became one of the best prep running backs in the state, ranking third in career touchdowns and second in career yards as of 2014. He was also a star basketball player, dropping 2,246 points over his high school career. However, Kirby stuck with football and the 6'1 running back took his talents to Virginia. As a Cav, Kirby got off to a relatively slow start, rushing for 311 yards and four touchdowns as a freshman and the team's backup running back. With Marcus Wilson graduating after the season, Kirby took over and rushed for 1,020 yards and 11 total TDs during his sophomore season. He led the team in rushing the next two years, finishing his career with 3,348 rushing yards, 1,022 receiving yards, and 32 total touchdowns. That made him Virginia's all-time leading rusher, though Tiki Barber and Thomas Jones would later eclipse that mark. It's also worth noting that he led the team in receptions as a junior and senior, showing off his versatility out of the backfield. Kirby was selected in the third round of the 93 draft by the Dolphins. He played at Miami for three seasons where he showed his receiving prowess with two seasons of more than 65 catches out of the backfield. In 96, he was traded to San Francisco. That year, he had his best rushing season, totaling 559 yards and four touchdowns on the ground, while still bringing in more than 50 receptions. Injuries quickly started to catch up with him, and Kirby only started 13 games after that season before retiring after a broken ankle in 2002. He finished his career with 2,875 rushing yards, 3,222 receiving yards, and 43 total touchdowns. Notably, Kirby also went 4 for 6 as a passer with 3 touchdowns and no interceptions, giving him a career passer rating of 149.3. As of 2014, Kirby was working as a personal trainer while spending his summers working with kids at a camp in Maine. It looks like he's also gotten into competitive cornhole, and his son Takai Kirby signed with Virginia to play tight end in 2023. Rick Meyer, quarterback. Meyer threw for 3,973 yards and 30 touchdowns during his senior year of high school, besting former All-USA Today player Jeff George's Indiana records. He headed to Notre Dame for college ball, waiting a year behind Tony Rice before taking over as the team's starter as a sophomore. Meyer led the team to a 28-7-1 record, with bowl wins at both the Sugar and Cotton Bowl in his final two seasons. Over his fighting Irish career, he racked up 5,997 yards and 41 touchdowns through the air, while adding 17 as a runner. Meyer was named quarterback of the year as a senior, and the Seahawks made him the second overall pick in the 93 draft. As a rookie, he set then-NFL records for attempts, completions, and yards to earn second place for the NFL Offensive Rookie of the Year award behind his former Notre Dame teammate, Jerome Bettis. However, issues with accuracy would plague Meyer during his four years in Seattle as he threw 56 interceptions to only 41 TDs. In 97, the team signed free agent Warren Moon and shipped Meyer to Chicago. He would only start three games that year and asked to be released ahead of the next season. Meyer signed with Green Bay to back up Brett Favre, but never played. He then signed with the Jets and played eight games in place of injured starter Vinny Testaverde. Meyer spent several more years as a backup in San Francisco and Oakland before being promoted to starter with the Raiders in 2003 when Rich Gannon injured his shoulder. He started eight games and the team went two and six. He signed with the Lions after one last season, but never saw the field. Meyer retired after the 2004 season after 12 seasons in the NFL and is widely seen as one of the worst quarterback busts. Since retiring, Meyer has opened a winery and runs a foundation benefiting kids. Derek Brown, running back. Brown moved to Anaheim to play high school ball. There, he rushed for over 3,000 yards in a single season, and the Nebraska Cornhuskers, among many other suitors, came calling. Brown's touches were limited at first in Nebraska, but in 91, he rushed for 1,313 yards and 14 TDs. He was named a third-team All-American and first-team All-Big 8 player. He followed that up with 1,011 yards and four touchdowns while splitting carries with Calvin Jones and battling a shoulder injury. 
Brown was then drafted in the fourth round by the Saints in the 93 draft. As a rookie, he led the team in rushing yards with 705, but that would be his best pro season as he started to split carries with Mario Bates in 94 and continued to slide further down the depth chart until he was out of the NFL after the 96 season. In 2001, he signed with the San Francisco Demons in the XFL, though it doesn't look like he accumulated any stats. In the years since, it appears that he's stuck in California and has been leading a relatively normal life. Rudy Harris, running back. Harris was a stud running back at Brockton High, leading the team to 20 straight victories at one point while running alongside Darnell Campbell in the team's backfield. After a standout prep campaign, Harris joined Clemson and rushed for 353 yards and five total touchdowns during his first season with the Tigers. With his 6'1", 255-pound frame, Harris converted a fullback, helping pave the way for Rodney Blunt while still plowing into the end zone several times. Over his three years with the school, Harris rushed for 1,104 yards and 18 total touchdowns. The Bucks made him the 91st pick in the 93 draft, but the big back was limited in his touches during his two seasons in the NFL. In total, Harris rushed for 29 yards, caught 59 more, and scored one touchdown before leaving the NFL behind for what seems like a life out of the spotlight. Bob Whitfield Offensive Line At Banning, Whitfield teamed with Mark Tucker to form a dominant offensive line. Tucker decided to head to USC, while Whitfield went to Stanford to play under Dennis Green. He won a starting job as a freshman and won back-to-back first-team All-Pac-10 nods in 90 and 91, while being named a consensus All-American in 91. Whitfield skipped his senior season, and the Falcons picked him with the 8th pick in the 92 draft. He played with the Falcons through the 2003 season, earning a Pro Bowl nod in 98. That year, Atlanta advanced to the Super Bowl, but lost to the Broncos after shockingly upsetting the explosive Minnesota Vikings in the NFC Championship. After being released, Whitfield joined the Jags for a season before ending his career after two years with the Giants. While playing with the Giants, he filled in for an injured starter and lost his cool in two separate games, headbutting opposing players. That earned him the nickname Headbutt Bob in the New York media. Following the second incident, he was benched in the season and retired after 2006. Early in his playing career, Whitfield had established Patchwork Recording Studios, which worked with artists like OutKast, T.I., 50 Cent, Snoop Dogg, Beyonce, and several others. He also worked in broadcast for the UK's NFL coverage and in local Atlanta radio and television. Whitfield was married to the Real Housewives of Atlanta cast member Cherie Whitfield until they divorced in 2008. His son Cody played safety for Stanford and works as the cornerbacks coach at UCLA as of 2024. Mike Wells, Offensive Line Wells made the list as an offensive lineman, but was named the Midlands Defensive Player of the Year and recorded 411 tackles over his high school career. The big man also won the state title in discus as a sophomore and senior before heading to Iowa for college ball. As a Hawkeye, Wells made the first team all Big Ten twice in 92 and 93. The defensive tackle posted career numbers of 54 tackles for loss, 33 sacks, and 309 tackles. He also forced a fumble and returned one interception 38 yards against Minnesota. Speaking of the state, the Vikings picked him in the fourth round of the 94 draft, but cut him before the season started. The Lions quickly scooped him up, and he played with Detroit through the 97 season, largely as a backup. That year, he became a starter and recorded 66 tackles and one sack. He then signed with Chicago and was a fixture on the team's line for the next three years. Wells claimed that he was willing to take a pay cut in 2001 to sign with the team, but Chicago decided to let him walk and he played one last season with the Colts before retiring after picking up an injury. Wells moved to St. Louis and worked as a high school coach until 2017 when he decided to retire and help his son Logan with his own college recruitment. It looks like the younger Wells signed with Air Force, but it doesn't appear he made the final roster. Rudy Barber, Offensive Line Barber's dad, Rudolph, played college ball at Bethune-Cookman before spending a season in the NFL with the Dolphins, so it's no surprise the younger Barber had legit talent. In high school, Barber anchored an offensive line that averaged 300 pounds. That's bigger than some college and NFL lines at the time. However, Barber was the smallest of the bunch at 275 pounds. That didn't stop him from securing a spot to play for the Miami Hurricanes. As a three-year starter for the Canes, Barber helped keep opponents off of quarterback Gino Toretta, helping the team win a title in 91. Barber didn't make it to the NFL, though his brother Cantroy did spend some time in the league as a fullback with the Patriots, Panthers, and Dolphins. As of 2024, it looks like Rudy is working as a church pastor back in Miami. Stuart Tyner Tyner left Texas to play for Lou Holtz at Notre Dame. The 6'4 high school standout played both ways for the Fighting Irish, 
but doesn't seem to have seen much on-field action. Instead, he focused on his studies and eventually decided to join the U.S. Army. He would work in various military positions over the next 22 years until retiring in 2023. Chet Lachetta, Offensive Line. First, apologies if I mispronounced that last name. I couldn't find a source giving me the correct pronunciation online. That said, Lachetta left Chicago to attend Notre Dame alongside Meyer, Tyner, and one more player we'll get to shortly. However, if you search for Tret Lachetta, most of what you're going to get is about a book he was quoted in called Under the Tarnished Dome from 1994. It details several alleged scandals from Lou Holtz's time with the school, including rampant steroid abuse and academic misconduct, among other issues. For his part, Lachetta is quoted as saying about Holtz, first, he grabbed me by the face mask and shook it, then he just spit on me. Either way, it looks like Lachetta left his playing career behind soon after and has retreated into obscurity in the years since. Pedro Cherry, wide receiver. Perry took his talents to Auburn to play wide receiver under Pat Dye and catch passes from Stan White. During his three years on the team, Cherry posted 312 yards receiving and one touchdown. Cherry earned his bachelor's degree in industrial engineering and went on to earn an MBA from the school. As of 2024, Cherry was working as the president and CEO of a leading energy company in Atlanta. Kevin Williams, wide receiver. Williams was a do-everything player in high school, tallying 1,997 yards receiving, 1,339 yards rushing, and 45 touchdowns, including 10 on returns. He then left Dallas to attend Miami alongside Rudy Barber and a fellow Dallas kid we'll get to on defense. Williams took a redshirt year before bursting onto the scene as one of the fastest returnmen in the country, boasting 4.28 speed in the 40. In his second season, he broke out, posting 1,183 all-purpose yards, returning three kicks for touchdowns, and hauling in three touchdown grabs. For that, he won Big East Special Teams Player of the Year and made the All-Big East First Team and First Team All-American squads. During his follow-up campaign, Williams was somewhat hampered by injuries and teams refusing to kick to him, but he became more of a weapon through the air while also tossing a 68-yard touchdown in his only career passing attempt. The Cowboys picked him in the second round of the 93 draft. Throughout most of his time in Dallas, Williams was a dynamic return man while also getting limited time at wideout. In 95, Alvin Harper left the team, finally giving Williams a chance to start opposite Michael Irvin. His numbers improved, but he never took that step towards stardom at the position and was injured in 96. With Dallas, Williams won two Super Bowls, but he decided to leave the team before the 96 season when the Cowboys brought in Anthony Miller to take over as the team's second receiver. He signed with the Cardinals and led the league in kick return yards. He'd then spend two years in Buffalo and a season in San Francisco before retiring after the 2000 season. He finished his career with 12,085 all-purpose yards and 13 total touchdowns. Craig Hentrick, kicker. Hentrick is the other Notre Dame player I mentioned earlier. While with the Fighting Irish, Hentrick took over both place kicking and punting duties, racking up 44.1 yards per punt while booting 39 of 56 career field goals and 177 of 180 extra points. For that, he was selected by the Jets in the eighth round of the 93 draft but was released and signed with the Packers. He spent four years in Green Bay, handling punting and adding kickoffs to his repertoire in 96 when the team won a Super Bowl. He also did some spot field goal kicking as needed, something he continued throughout his career. In 98, he signed with the Titans and made his first All-Pro and Pro Bowl teams that season. He'd make both lists again in 2003 and kick for the Titans through the 2009 season when injuries forced him into retirement. Hendrick averaged 42.9 yards per punt over his career and hit 8 of his 15 field goal attempts. Since hanging him up, he's been working as a punting coach. And now for the defense. Sean Gilbert, linebacker. The 6'5", 318-pound Gilbert converted a defensive tackle when he headed to Pitt for college ball. Like several players from his era, he didn't play as a freshman due to the Prop 48 rule, but racked up 21 tackles for a loss, 6 sacks, and an interception that he returned for a touchdown during his two years with the team. In 91, he was named to the first team All-Big East team before heading to the NFL. He posted a 440-pound bench press and 4.5940 40 during the pre-draft process, and the Rams selected him with the third pick in the 92 draft. Gilbert made the all-rookie team during his first year after racking up five sacks and 54 tackles. The next year, he was named to the Pro Bowl after compiling 10.5 sacks and 81 tackles. In 95, he was converted to defensive end, but the team brought in Leslie O'Neill ahead of the 96 season and traded Gilbert to Washington. He had a solid season and Washington gave him the franchise tag. 
Gilbert was unhappy with the contract and sat out the entire 97 season. The team franchise tagged him again, and after a lengthy process, he signed with the Panthers while Washington received two first-round picks in compensation. He had three solid seasons for Carolina before injuries started to slow him down. In 2002, he broke his hip and the Panthers released him at the end of the season. Gilbert spent one last season with the Raiders before retiring with 475 tackles, 11 forced fumbles, 2 interceptions, and 42.5 sacks. Since then, he's been working and coaching, most recently as the head coach at a North Carolina high school. Gilbert's nephews Darrell Rivas and Mark Gilbert also spent time in the NFL, and his son Zach signed with Pitt in 2015, but a heart condition kept him off the field. He'd go on to play at the JUCO level. Alonzo Spellman, defensive line. Spellman racked up 104 tackles and 14 sacks during his senior year of high school while also averaging 17 points and 22 rebounds on the hardwood. The 6'4 defensive star decided to stick with football and head to Ohio State for his college career. He was a starter from the jump at outside linebacker, posting 10 tackles for loss and 4 sacks to earn his first second team All Big Ten nod. The coaching staff moved into defensive end the next year and he performed well, making the second team again. However, Spellman was suspended from the Liberty Bowl after he was caught having another student take a test for him. As a junior, he was named to the first team All Big Ten team after another solid season and decided to head to the NFL. The Bears made him the 22nd pick in the 92 draft and had him back up Richard Dent at defensive end. In a reserve role, he recorded 30 tackles and 4 sacks. His second season was similar, but in 94, Chicago didn't re-sign Dent and Spellman became the starter. He responded with 60 tackles, 7 sacks, 8 passes defended, and 1 block kick. Spellman's next two seasons were equally solid, though he flipped between right and defensive ends between seasons. In 97, Spellman picked up a shoulder injury in week 5, missing 5 games. He also had several off-field incidents that led to him being suspended for 3 more games. It all came to a head that next summer when he barricaded himself into his publicist's house, refusing to take an NFL-mandated drug test. An eight-hour standoff with police ensued and only stopped when Bears linebacker Mike Singletary came to the scene and calmed Spellman down enough to take him to the hospital. He was out of football for a year before signing with the Cowboys as a free agent after receiving treatment for bipolar disorder. Dallas moved into defensive tackle and Spellman started 16 games, finishing in fourth place for comeback player of the year. He played one more year in Dallas, starting 15 games before playing five games for Detroit in 2001 before his NFL career ended. Spellman came out of retirement in 2005 to play for the Las Vegas Gladiators in the Arena Football League for one season. During that time, he also spent some time training for professional MMA fighting. Unfortunately, Spellman largely stopped taking his medication after his NFL career ended, which led to several incidents over the years. In 2002, he disrupted a fight during a manic episode, threatening members of the crew, and was sentenced to 18 months in federal prison. In 2008, he was arrested again after an apparent altercation in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and was released from prison in 2012. In 2015, he was arrested once again and was charged with possession of less than 50 grams of marijuana and several outstanding warrants. Chuck Jones, Defensive Line the 6'4", 290-pound tackle was a force during his high school days in Ohio. Jones boasted huge size and 4.940 speed, and he originally signed with Ohio State for college ball. However, academic issues kept him from ever stepping on campus. It looks like Jones never played college football and has faded into obscurity in the years since. I did find an obituary from March 2023, but I'm not 100% sure if it's him. Sterling Palmer, Defensive Line Palmer played his high school football at St. Thomas Aquinas, which has widely been considered one of the best athletic programs in the country, producing future pros like Michael Irvin, the Bosa brothers, Geno Atkins, and many others. Palmer decided to stay in-state and play his college ball at Florida State. After taking a redshirt season, Palmer was a solid outside linebacker and defensive end for the Knolls, totaling 8.5 sacks, 10 tackles for loss, and 111 tackles. Washington then picked him in the fourth round of the 93 draft, and he played for the team for four seasons, starting most of the games he was healthy for, and totaling 11 sacks and 146 tackles. During his four seasons, he battled several injuries and was largely out of football by 97. Palmer does seem to have signed with the Patriots in 99, but never played for the team. He did play for the Houston Marshals in the Spring Football League and Chicago Forces of the XFL in 2000 and 2001, respectively. In 2018, his son Sterling Palmer Jr. signed with Florida International University, and the 6'7 youngster played for the Panthers through 2021. Tomasi Amatuani 
defensive line. Again, my apologies for any mispronunciation. I couldn't find a good source. Amatawani was another Prop 48 player who signed with Colorado's top-ranked class in 89. He left the school without ever playing a down, signing with Palomar College, a community college in California. There, he became a JC All-American and helped the Comets to a title in 91. He didn't finish out his college career at Arizona University. As of 2016, he was working as the head of a nonprofit for the handicapped somewhere in the Midwest. Eric Shaw, defensive line. Shaw started his college career at Florida State to transfer to Louisiana Tech after his redshirt season. He might have been another Prop 48 player, but I've been unable to find anything confirming that. I couldn't find any stats from his time there, but the linebacker played well enough to be selected in the 12th round of the 92 draft by the Bengals. He played for the team for three years, starting 9 to 14 games during his second season and racking up 49 tackles. His third season was hampered by injuries, and he signed with the Chiefs in the offseason, but never played a down for the team. After several years out of the game, he tried to make a comeback with the Shreveport Knights in the Regional Football League, but injured his neck after one game and retired for good. Shaw then dove into coaching at the high school level, where he was working as a head coach as of 2013. Richard McKenzie, Linebacker McKenzie was a stud in high school and was widely considered the best linebacker in his class. He turned into a solid player at Penn State, making the second team all Big East team in 91. From his outside linebacker position, he showed a skill for getting to the quarterback, but he had a few off-field issues related to academics and being late to practice, which led coach Joe Paterno to bench him for the final bowl game of his career. That benching seemingly scared some NFL teams away from drafting him early, and McKenzie wasn't selected until the sixth round by the Browns. He played for the team for three seasons, but only made eight appearances where he picked up 1.5 sacks. He spent time on the Patriots and Bucks, but never made the final roster of either team. McKenzie then spent several years playing in the Arena Football League, making the second team All-Arena team in 99. From his social media, it looks like McKenzie is leading a normal life, taking care of his kids. That said, he did seemingly have a bit part in the 1999 film, Any Given Sunday. Jesse Armstead, Linebacker Armstead is that other Miami player I mentioned earlier, though it's worth noting that he played for Carter High School in Dallas when they won the 1988 state championship over Permian High School, which most will remember from the 2004 film Friday Night Lights. During his senior season, Armstead was asked by teammates and fellow D1 recruits Derek Evans and Gary Edwards to join them in a series of robberies, but he refused. Evans and Edwards would eventually be sentenced to 20 and 16 years respectively in prison. When he got to Miami, Armstead was a stud, helping the team win national titles in 89 and 91. However, Armstead tore his ACL during his sophomore season, leading the teams being concerned about drafting him. Eventually, the Giants picked him in the 8th round of the 93 draft. He quickly proved those concerns were overrated, as he grew into a 5-time Pro Bowler with the Giants over his 9 years with the team. He was also selected to one first-team All-Pro and two second-team All-Pro teams during his time in New York. In 2002, he signed with Washington and played for two years. Armstead signed with the Panthers ahead of the 2004 season, but retired after a preseason injury. In 2007, he signed a one-day contract with the Giants to officially retire with the team. Armstead racked up 971 tackles, 40 sacks, 13 forced fumbles, and 12 interceptions over his career. He joined the Giants coaching staff in 2008, where he seems to still be working as of 2024. Marcel Brown, defensive back. Brown was scheduled to attend USC for college ball. However, after his redshirt freshman season, the defensive back was arrested alongside Trojan teammate Howard McCowan and another man for a string of robberies and a kidnapping charge. In 91, they were sentenced to 15 years in prison. As far as I can tell, Brown got out and was working as a rep as of 2016, though McCowan did unfortunately die in prison in 2006. Grady Cabanis, defensive back. Cabanis's father played professionally for the Broncos and Falcons in the late 60s before playing several years in the CFL, so it was no surprise when Grady Jr. showed an aptitude for the gridiron. He would head to Texas to play college ball, starting four years at DB for the Longhorns. He went undrafted but signed with the Oilers in the preseason before jumping to the CFL. After wrapping that career up, Cabanis signed up with Morgan Stanley as a financial trader. His son Jai played at TCU, while his other two sons, Trevor and Tony, played at East Texas Baptist. Johnny Davis, defensive back. Davis took his talents to Florida State for college ball. The DB accumulated five picks, 2.5 sacks, and 135 total tackles over his four years with the Knolls. It doesn't look like he played professionally, instead entering a career in public service. 
Or at least, I think that's where he ended up, as someone who appears to be our guy currently works as the secretary of the Florida Lottery after working at the Orlando Regional Chamber of Commerce. Paul Stonehouse Punter Stonehouse punted for Stanford during his college career, averaging 39.1 yards per punt across his four-year career. It doesn't look like he played professionally, but he did get into coaching after his college career ended. Since then, the Stonehouse family tree has had several D1 punters, with John Stonehouse punting for USC from 92 to 95, and Jeff Banks doing it for Washington State from 96 to 97. Paul's son Ryan started punting for Colorado State in 2017, and is currently punting for the Titans. He led the league in punting in 2022, and were out to being named a second team All-Pro. In 2023, he had a nasty knee injury on his non-kicking leg, but looks to be back to his dominant ways in 2024, as he's averaging 52.4 yards per punt through three games. Another Stonehouse, Jack, currently punts for Syracuse. 